Hey everybody, this is Adam Asher, and you are listening to another edition of the Edge of Adventure podcast. It's great to have you. And today we're going to be focusing on two countries, the countries of India and Nepal, and an organization that works with the people there doing a very important thing, a very important work. And we're going to be finding out about that today. Karuna Trust is our focus. And joining me from Karuna Trust right now, I have two gentlemen on the line, Sudhika and Sanganath. We will uh, start with you, Sudhika. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. And Sangana as well. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So you guys are joining from actually two different locations. Uh, I'm, of course, right now in my headquarters of Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. Uh, Sudhika, you are in what city right now? In London. Yeah. Okay, South, you're in London. South East London. And Sanganat, you are joining us from? I'm in Cambridge. Welcome, and it's so great to have you on the show. Sudhika, Karuna Trust, if you were to introduce this to someone, and give them a, a, a good understanding, the overview of what Karuna Trust does and the importance of the work that you do, how would you say it? How would you uh, convey that to somebody hearing it for the first time? Okay, so... Uh, Karana Trust has been working for about 40 years, um, particularly with communities in India and more recently Nepal affected by um, issues to do with caste discrimination. So we were founded 40 years ago as part of a Buddhist movement to work with Buddhists primarily in India who were part of uh, what's known as the Ambedkarite Buddhist community. So people who converted to Buddhism in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, to get away from the uh, the discrimination and the the, the disadvantages of the uh, the caste system. So since then, we've grown and developed. I think we're now a sort of medium-sized international organisation working in different countries. But we always work with communities that are affected by caste discrimination, and we're a Buddhist organisation. So we're linked to. An international Buddhist movement called the Tri Ratna Buddhist Community. That's Sudhika joining us here on the Edge of Adventure from Karuna Trust, and Sangana is also on the line. Sangana, let me let me ask you something here. Of course, we're just starting off this conversation. There's lots to to delve into. We're going to talk about a lot of different things, but help me and help the audience understand what discrimination is this caste dis discrimination that Sudika mentioned what is it and how bad is it uh, it's very difficult to explain the caste discrimination actually but um i was born in india in southwest of india if you know uh, goa or mumbai you know between that i, I grew up in a small village uh, in india and basically i was grew up there and i was um born in uh, lower caste communities uh, if you are familiar with caste system caste system is divided into four um, classes if you like and i was i was uh, born in uh, bottom of the caste basically once you're born in the bottom of the caste you will remain in the bottom of the caste regardless you are educated you regardless how much you money got how much property you got you will be discriminated because of that caste so when I was growing up in India, um, I have faced discrimination uh, so much, uh, uh, especially my mother. She's an, an uneducated woman. Uh, she used to work in farm. The farm owner was higher caste. They never touched her because of she was from bottom of the caste. So the caste system um, exists in all sorts of level. Um, so that's that's if you like that's uh, one of the form of discrimination is people even don't touch you because of you are from that particular caste, and caste system is still exist on every every level uh, in Indian society. Yeah, that's that's something I could uh, you know summarize about caste system, really. Mm -hmm. And you experienced it firsthand, and I think as we go through this conversation, we will mm -hmm. we'll be mm -hmm. able to understand more about that and also why 
working with Karuna Trust is so important to you. I want to stay stay on that topic though, uh, Sudika. You, you know, you you come at this from a different perspective. I mean, the the caste discrimination is the same, but your perspective of it would be different. Uh, what what's going on with with the the caste system and why the discrimination and how how is it affecting the people of India and Nepal? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think it's difficult for a, for a Westerner really to get their head around caste discrimination. I think I'm, you know, I've been working, you know, going to India a lot over about twenty years, and I'm still only really beginning to understand it because, in a way, there's nothing really equivalent in our in our culture or our understanding. But for example, um, Dalit people very, very rarely own any land. You know, so if Dalit people are working in rural areas, they're nearly always tenant farmers. And caste is very much linked to people's livelihoods. So people in the lower caste or the Dalit communities do jobs which are thought of as being dirty and polluting. And there's a kind of religious ideology behind it all which um, makes people from the Dalit communities or labels people from the Dalit communities not only kind of inferior but even kind of polluting if you so to mean so and and of course you know within the caste system people aren't allowed to marry outside their caste so caste will continue from one generation to the other without any you know without any uh opportunities for people to 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 move from one caste to another so it's it, it and and you know it maps on to all kinds of things like level of education it maps on to opportunities for jobs uh it it, it maps on to marriage opportunities where you can live so it's very, very sort of strict and very, very sort of all encompassing. And, you know, many of the communities that we work with, you know, you can travel in India and, and, and you know, stay with middle class people in the cities who are living lives very similar to the life that we're living. And yet you would go, you know, 40, 50 miles outside the city, you'd find people living in conditions that are, you know, to our, to our eyes, more or less medieval, you know, very, very poor conditions, you know. So there's this real sort of divide between people. And, you know, obviously coming at it as, as you know, from a Western Buddhist perspective, you know, um, you know, a tremendous amount of suffering that's caused by the caste system. I'm sorry, I've got, I've got a dog in the background. Right. And the, <laughs> the pup, yeah, it sounds like the puppy is wanting in on the conversation. <laughs> I'll, just, uh, I'll just let her out. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Sangana, let me ask you this, you know, when you, and, and I, I get to ask the questions mm. because I, I'm learning, right? And mm. I also know that the audience is learning too. And so mm. I, I may ask some questions that are very basic and, and, and so forgive me for that. But the scenario that is being described by both uh, you and Sudhika, is, is this exclusive to India? Is this also present in Nepal? I mean, I know those countries are right there together. I'm sure that there's differences, but is this an issue that faces both of those countries? I, I believe so. Um, the caste system is something uh, very difficult to overcome because essentially it's uh, in people's mind. It's deeply rooted in their culture and attitude. So for example, if they move out from India, they will take the caste with them um, outside India. So, for example, even the caste system, the caste uh, system, and um, the attitude people will bring to the wherever they go go on. I never been to Nepal myself, but I can imagine you know uh, the caste system probably is exist there as well. Uh, Sudaka might able to give more answer on this one because he probably have been to uh, Nepal. Yeah, caste, caste is, is very much practiced in Nepal, particularly in, in sort of rural areas. Where, where Karana works, a lot of it's in the south of Nepal, which is an area that's quite similar to India, close to the Indian border. And in a way, many of the, the caste 
issues are the same between India and Nepal. But maybe one thing you could you can add to that is, along with caste discrimination, I think it's sort of linked to caste discrimination. In India and Nepal, you see very extreme forms of gender discrimination as well. So girls being denied access to education. Um, in Nepal, for example, um, girls who are having their periods are expected to go and move out of their houses and live kind of in cow sheds because, you know, um, girls or women having their periods are thought to be unclean. So you've got this idea of sort of religious or ritual impurity that some people or people in, in, in certain situations are thought of as being unclean or impure. And for that reason, they're, um, they're sort of pushed to the, to the periphery of things and not allowed to participate fully in, in activities. Um, so it's interesting that caste and gender discrimination tend to go very closely together um, in the areas that we work. And we try and tackle both of those as much as we can. This is The Edge of Adventure, and that's the voice of Sudaka. He is head of programs at Karuna Trust. You can find out more about them at karuna.org, karuna.org. That's spelled with a K. And, of course, if you're watching the video version, you're able to see that throughout the program being uh, displayed on the screen. We're also going to, in just a minute here, we'll begin the part of the program where I get to show some some photos and pictures from, from what Karuna is Karuna is doing there in uh, Nepal and in India. Thank you both for kind of helping me and the audience understand the caste system and the discrimination. Okay, I think that that's a great it's context for what Karuna does, and I think it's important to understand that, or at least a little bit, as to to kind of go into that, so that we can now think about what Karuna Trust is doing and who they're working with and what a remarkable opportunity and a remarkable um, work it is to get to work with, with these precious people and to uh, help them in, in the ways we're about to discuss. So I know from my research that there are at least three key areas that Karuna focuses on education, livelihood, and gender equality. And I'm sure there's many other uh, aspects to that, but I think um, at least those three. I want to be sure we get into today. Uh, Sudhika, tell me, uh, tell me about the education aspect of mm. of what Karuna Trust mm. does. Mm. Well, I mean, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that um, traditionally in India and Nepal, Dalits are denied access to education. So, um, within the sort of traditional caste scheme. The idea was that the higher caste people would become very educated, would become uh, experts, uh, highly educated people, and that the lower you went down the, the, the caste system, the less access to education there was. So you've got communities who for hundreds and hundreds of years have been denied access to education and for whom still, you know, the opportunities for education are very, very difficult. And uh, there, there was a, in the in the 1950s there was a, a a great leader of the Dalit communities called Dr. Ambedkar, who's one of the most important figures in in modern Indian history, and he was the the champion and the leader of the Dalit people, and he believed in a kind of peaceful revolution, you know, uh, of uh, lifting up the Dalits and giving them opportunities to climb out of the the poverty and marginalization that they'd been being 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 forced into and to give them opportunities to 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 integrate into the mainstream society and and his kind of central message was around education he was saying you know for these communities to change and i think it's probably true for downtrodden and disadvantaged communities the world over the the one main thing that marginalized communities need is access to education because you know if the next generation can get educated then there's a chance for them to start to climb out of the sort of vicious circle of poverty that, that, that they've been caught in and many of the communities that we work with 
most people are what we call daily wage laborers so in other words they have to work one day to be able to eat the next day so they're getting paid daily wages uh, and of course you know people on daily wages are tremendously vulnerable because if anything happens you know if, if they fall out with their local farmer or i don't know the crops fail or um their local factory doesn't need them to work the next day if there's anything that happens they just lose their income so they're right on the kind of knife edge all the time and through education there's just this opportunity for people to climb out of that sort of daily wage economy so you know if you get educated then maybe you can get a role in a in a local shop or maybe you can get a job in a local office you can do something where you're starting to get a little bit more sort of job security and a little bit more i don't like to use the word status but if you know what i mean you 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 you're you're more able to do something that means that other people are likely to sort of treat you with greater respect so we see education as being you know absolutely key in in giving people opportunities to improve their lives and you know for, for the 40 years that we've been working many many of our projects are helping people get an education we've been running educational hostels for 20 or 30 years and we've seen people well, uh, people who come from you know very poor backgrounds you know they go to the hostel they get an education they're able to set up a small business or become a doctor or become a dentist and then in the next generation they in a sense have, have gained a degree of uh, financial security and social respect so in a way that's that's the way that we see education working in the context of our projects that's the voice of Sudaka. He's head of programs at Karuna Trust. You can look him up at karuna.org. Also on the line, Sangana is head of appeals for this organization. And Sangana, I wanted to get your perspective too on the educational piece. How have you seen a difference made in someone's life through educational opportunities that Karuna has been able to provide? Definitely. Um, I have witnessed Karuna's uh, first-handed uh, work when I was in India. I used to uh, work with some of projects as well. Uh, but uh, Karuna's one of project reached my village um, when I was a kid, when I was a child. And the project was focusing on teaching children, um, just firing their imagination, really. Um, so that's how I come across Karuna in the first place. But also, I used to live near uh, where Corona uh, supported project uh, called Hostel Project, Education Hostel Project, where children will come from a uh, deprived area, from a rural area and stay there and educate themselves. So I have seen so many people educating uh, through this project. But what I want to mention uh, here really, as Sudhaka mentioned about Dr. Ambedkar, and um, Dr. Ambedkar essentially give a very strong message to his followers like me he said educate agitate and be organized and this message is um, really heard by his followers and they're really thriving themselves they're really putting themselves to educate themselves whatever opportunity they will get they educate themselves so growing up in india in his community from lower caste community i have seen so many my friends family just really um, put themselves, educate themselves. And because of that education, they have a better opportunities. They have voice, they have more knowledge. They can organize themselves and they can agitate, you know, if there is a injustice with them. So education, I would say, is key for us. And uh, what Dr. Ambedkar has given is uh, beyond our imagination, actually, Adam. I mean, I'm talking in front of you all because of Dr. Ambedkar. If Dr. Ambedkar wouldn't exist, I wouldn't have this opportunity to talk with you at all. So education is key, as Dr. Ambedkar said, but with that education, he said, be organized and educate as well. Turning now back to Sudhaka, as you guys have been listening, I've got two, two great guys on the, on the line today joining me for the program, Sudhaka and Sanganat. And they both work with and very passionate about the work that Karuna Trust does. And yet they have very different 
backgrounds. So we have some other things to ask. I'm going to ask some specific pointed questions about Karuna in just a minute. But, you know, especially since I'm going to kind of drew this point out, let's talk about your each individual backgrounds, okay? And Sudhika, let's start with you, your background, um, you know, who you are, where you came from, and what has drawn you to Karuna Trust. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is fascinating that, you know, um, you know, Sanganath and I are really good friends. We come from such different backgrounds. It's almost like a miracle somehow that we've ended up on this call together. It's hard to hard to believe, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I had quite, quite a conventional upbringing, really, in, in, in the UK. I, you know, I went to a, a, a good school. I went to a good university. Um, but I think in my mid-20s, I started feeling kind of, dissatisfied with my life and you know through a series of events i came into contact with buddhism and uh, started meditating and finding out more about the buddhist teachings and just involving myself in the work of, of of the buddhist movement here in the uk and you know as part of that i came across the work of karuna trust and up until that point i'd been working in the charity sector in the uk i worked for groups like oxfam and greenpeace here in the UK doing fundraising work. So this was something that had always really interested me. And I was very, I don't know whether this will ring any bells for anyone, but I was very affected by, you know, the whole Live Aid concerts of in the 1980s. There was a big uh, public campaign around the famine that had gone on in Ethiopia. So I felt, you know, very drawn into overseas development work and trying to work for the benefit of people who were, were disadvantaged in different parts of the world. So so everything sort of came together really for me But when I joined Karana Trust because, you know, in a way it sort of joined up my interest in Buddhism with, you know, wanting to make a difference in the world and wanting to be involved in overseas development. And really through Karana Trust, I came to find out more about, you know, the movement in India and about Dr. Ambedkar, about the caste system and, the, you know, you know, we, we talked then about the sort of the peaceful revolution, Dr. Ambedkar and his peaceful revolution in India, of the sort of the uplift of, of millions and millions of people across India. And I think I also had a bit of an, a, a connection with India because my father was born in India in the 1930s, right at the end of the British period in India. Um, you know, my dad was actually born and he, he left India when he was about five, but I think I remember as a child hearing him tell me stories about India. So I think India has always had a kind of bit of a fascination for me. And of course, it's, you know, India is the country where, you know, all the Buddhist sacred sites are. So, you know, India is a very, very special, precious place for, for, for Buddhists the world over. So, so yeah, I, I really came to it through an interest in overseas development and an interest in Buddhism. And, uh, you know, the last 20 years have been a real learning for me about about India and I mean you know, I love India I think India is the most you know wonderful place and at the same time you know getting to know the situation in India you also get to see some really shocking and really you know appalling things as well so yeah it's got both 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 sides to it you know wonderful and and you know appalling at times that's a um peek into the background of Sutaka. We're just barely getting to, to know him. I mean, I know there's so much more to tell and just a um, very fascinating story. But I wanted you as the listeners, I wanted you to have an understanding of who Sutaka is and how he comes to Karuna Trust. I think that's important for you to understand. And then also equally as important is to understand uh, Sanganat and his background. He's alluded to it a little bit, but uh, I'm going to give him the chance to talk a little bit more about it because both your background Sangana, who you are where you came from and what drew you to Karuna Trust yeah so I was born in India uh, in uh, 1982 I was uh, grew up in a very small village of south uh, west of India um, uh, yeah and then I was growing up uh, in a village um, uh, as I said before, you know, I was uh, I was born in a lower caste community. Uh, so with that, I faced a lot of um, 
uh, in difficulties uh, as well. Um, but when I was growing up, uh, Buddhism Buddhism was very important for me. Uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar, we talked earlier, he, he converted into Buddhism in 1956. And since then, he really um, asked his followers uh, to take, you know, this religion on. If you want to change your mind, if you want to educate yourself, if you want to uh, develop yourself, if, if you want to change a society, if you want to um, eradicate caste, you know, caste discrimination, you, you've got to change change your religion. And that's I was uh, very much inspired by Buddhist values such as equality, fraternity and freedom, as Dr. Ambedkar emphasized, you know, he draw from uh, Buddha's life. So when I was uh, in village, Karunas won a project reached to village, teaching uh, classes for children. That's how I come across Karuna Trust. And I'm really grateful for Karuna because, uh, you know, it's not easy to get opportunities like this uh, in the village uh, for these uh, particular communities. And they reached to my village. That's why I, I was able to access, uh, access their opportunity or facilities. But more importantly, I think Karuna's connection with Dr. Ambedkar, because our Karuna's vision is um, deeply, deeply rooted uh, in Dr. Ambedkar's vision and mission. Uh, so that's why I, I felt very strong connection with Karuna uh, because of Dr. Ambedkar. Yeah. And now I live in UK last 15, 16 years in Cambridge. And I feel so sometimes, sometimes very shame, really. People don't know very much about Dr. Ambedkar in UK. They know so much about Mahatma Gandhi, but people don't know very much about Dr. Ambedkar. And he is the greatest, greatest modern leader of India. Yeah, I think that's that's me, Adam. Thank you, Sanganat. So many questions. That every every interview, every podcast is different. They're all different. And while obviously through every podcast I have a an idea of what I, I want to accomplish. I want to get to know the people. I want to get to know the country and of course the work that the organization is doing. And, and those are all very important, but how we do that it, through the conversation is always different. It's always different. And, and today I'm um, struck by just uh, the uniqueness of this conversation. So this is, this is wonderful. And, and I'm being, I, I I'm going to get back to the livelihoods question. And I'm going to get back to the gender, gender equality, both of those being very, very important projects. But before we do, let, let's stay on this topic as I go back to Sudaka. And it, you know, you know, I come to the conversation as a Christian and uh, what I know about Buddhism is um, limited, right? And so in, in a nutshell, again, it, I'm sure this, you'll have to really simplify it. But Sudaka, what are the, what are the principles that drew you in? What are the principles mm. that uh, Sanganat is referring to that mm. the Karuna is built on? Mm. And it's why this work is something that both of you are mm. so passionate about. Mm. Well, I mean, B B Buddhism goes back to the teaching of the Buddha himself, Siddhartha Gautama, who, who taught in India, in northern India. In fact, uh, the Buddha was born just over the border in Nepal, in one of the areas where we, we now work. And then he lived most of his life in the, the, the area of northern India that just, just is on the border of Nepal. And, uh, and he, he attained, we believe that he attained enlightenment in his lifetime, um, which is the, the, if you like, the completion of wisdom, and completion of the human capacity for wisdom and compassion so he sort of explored and developed the the furthest most reach of the human potential and then for the rest of his life he he taught the path that leads to the state of enlightenment that he'd attained in his lifetime and so you know over the course of his life he gave very very detailed teachings which are preserved in the the early buddhist texts and, and basically, the, the Buddhist teaching takes the form of a path where through following the path, through following particular ways of life, one can transform oneself from, uh, from being dominated by 
the reactive tendencies of greed, hatred, and ignorance to the well, the full fruition of our potential for wisdom and compassion in this life. And Buddhism envisages the, the that completion also as the end of suffering. So through, uh, as it were, completing one's potential for wisdom and compassion, one also comes to a state where one is uh, free from suffering in this life. So in a way, that's the path that the Buddhist uh, teachings lay out for us. And, um, and a really kind of key part of that is what we call Sangha or spiritual community. So you know, as a Buddhist, one's deliberately living one's life in a way that uh, encourages and supports one's own growth and development, spiritually speaking, but also really treasuring and honouring our capacity to live together harmoniously in, in community. And, you know, one of the big links for, for Karana is that the Buddha himself, even though he taught two and a half thousand years ago, was critical of caste ideas about caste because in a way he saw that ideas about caste divided people from each other in a sense it, it, it they they form barriers between people and encourage certain people to look down on other people and treat other people with less than 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 full respect so within the original buddhist community people left aside their caste when they joined the buddhist community so Buddhism as a tradition in India and in South Asia has always been anti-caste. It's always been opposed to um, traditions of caste, traditions of separation and rigid hierarchy. So the Buddha always taught that, you know, the value of a human being comes from their own actions. You know, you, you are, you make yourself, you make the person that you are through your actions of body, speech and mind. And, and your your identity isn't defined by, you know, the circumstances of your birth, which which kind of layer of society you're sort of born into. So, Buddhism in the Indian context has always had this kind of radical social vision, if you like, of a, a much more egalitarian vision than what you get through the sort of traditional um, caste understandings. So. Um, I'm sure I, I could say a lot more than I that. I think, no, that's a great, that's but a great anyway, answer. It's fascinating, it's fascinating how, you know, people approach Buddhism in the West. Usually people in the West approach Buddhism because they want a way to deal with their own suffering. You know, people in the West tend to have a sort of psychological understanding of Buddhism. Whereas in my experience, people in India uh, see Buddhism as very much linked to sort of a social idealism. To, to a kind of uh, an aspiration for social change. Um, well, yeah. and that I think that's also why I want to toss that same question to Sanganat and uh, have his perspective on on the same thing: the uh, principles of Buddhism, and consequently the principles of Karuna, and why they are so important to him. Hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, in India, you can't really separate India from religion. In India, you have to have some kind of religion. You have to have uh, feel like you belongs to some kind of religion. So the India is, you can't really separate religion from India. But for me, growing up in India, um, uh, religion is, was so important. And because of Dr. Ambedkar, he converted into Buddhism in 1956. He really emphasizes, you know, change every religion and um, uh, since childhood really I, I was drawn, drawn to Dr. Ambedkar's vision and Buddha's vision um, and Dr. Ambedkar uh, really um, clearly said he said uh, the Buddha's religion is uh, based on equality fraternity and um, uh, liberty and he said this uh, principles he hasn't draw from French Revolution, but from Buddha's own philosophy. And, you know, you can understand uh, people like me, people from, uh, uh, you know, the caste mentality and the discrimination, the equality is so important for us. And we could not get that equality in Hindu religion. 
and uh, fraternity and liberty also is very important. So this principle was so deeply rooted in Buddha's teaching, which is also, you know, um, uh, attracted to me to become Buddhist. But not for not just only that, you know, uh, uh, as a, as a Buddhism really emphasizes on changing your mind and then changing society. So for to change my caste the conditioning conditioning also have to work on my attitude my my mind as well i have to transform my mind as well and buddhism give perfect kind of uh, tools to do that you know change my mind and also change people's mind as well for, for that reason but as a sudaka said you know the way we operate buddhism is more like social change you are practicing buddhism not only for your own development but also you have to develop society which is really inspired by dr ambedkar's vision and his example he has really shown that you know you you choose buddhism not only because your own development but for development of development for, of others as well and karuna is perfect perfect example for that you know uh, karuna is not just um, helping people to change their mind but also helping people to give opportunity to educate right livelihood you know eradicate poverty and give education and women's empowering and so on so that that's that's i can say really about um, how i see buddhism is uh, changing this is the edge of adventure my name is adam asher and i've got two great guests today sudaka who's head of programs and sanganat who is head of appeals both joining us from karuna trust they work in india they work in Nepal, they do a variety of things, and we're getting to know a little bit about each of those things today. And just the perspective on who they are, where they came from, what drew them to the organization, Kar uh, Karuna's principles, and the things that they hold dear uh, as, a, as a group, but also individually. Let me go back to Sudhika now to fill us in on the livelihoods. Uh, you know, I think you guys call them dignified livelihoods. That's one of the ways that you work um, in India and Nepal. And tell me what that looks like. Yeah, well, I mentioned before that, that one of the things about the caste system, the sort of tradition of the caste system, is that it maps on to livelihoods. So, I mean, I, I guess a, a little bit like, you know, medieval uh, Europe, y you know, you, 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 families are associated with particular livelihoods and the expectation is that a child will follow uh, their parents in terms of their livelihood so you have castes in India that are particularly associated with leather working for example or there'd be castes that are particularly associated with being priests or doctors so there's this there's this association of livelihood with caste and if you're born into a particular caste the very strong expectation is that you will stay uh, doing that particular livelihood for for the for the rest of your life and um and these 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 livelihoods are kind of hierarchical so people from the dominant castes would tend to dominate the sort of higher status uh higher income kind of livelihoods uh so you know professional livelihoods and people you know in the in the oppressed caste the dalit castes would tend to be limited to um low pay uh, low dignity low cleanliness types of work um, in a way the types of work that nobody would freely choose to do so i mean for example we work with some communities in india that traditionally are called manual scavengers so their job was to actually clean out the human excrement from dry latrines and there's millions of people in india who who were born into these communities where in a sense their their caste destiny their caste duty is to clean up other people's toilets you know to to, to carry the excrement in baskets on their heads so this is a you know quite an extreme example of a very very degrading uh, caste occupation so for example with those I mean we, we're involved in a in a very very inspiring project that 
uh, you know, encourages people from those communities to, in a way, just stop doing that occupation, just refuse to do that occupation, and then to uh, go through a sort of training and rehabilitation process so they can learn other types of livelihoods, for example, making clothing or making incense sticks, something where they're going to be able to get a better source of income, but perhaps even more importantly, get an income from something which is, you know, inherently more dignified and ennobling. So, you know, you know, with the manual scavenging, obviously, you know, they're carrying excrement all day. So they're, they're dirty, they, they smell, they're, they're treated, you know, very, very badly um, by other communities. They're, they're, they're seen as being kind of unclean and, and shunned and sort of pushed, pushed out to the kind of outlying areas of the village where nobody else would go. This is the kind of um, thing. And, you know, people have been living with that for generations and generations. One can only imagine, you know, how that would affect one psychologically to, to be in that kind of situation where you're constantly having these messages just reinforcing the, the, the idea that you're, from, you know, inferior, you're, you're dirty, you're polluting, and there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to carry on with that for the rest of your life. You know, it's it's a horrifying idea, you know, if you, if you start to, 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 to think about it. Um, you know, and yet, you know, through the kind of work that we've been doing, the kind of work we've been involved in, you know, people are coming out of that sort of background and learning new skills and learning to become, you know, leaders of their own communities. I and mean, at one point there was a there was an amazing um, amazing campaign organised by one of our partner organisations, where all the manual scavengers came to Delhi, and they knocked on the doors of the um, the members of Parliament, and and uh, you know when they opened the doors they asked them to to vote for legislation which outlawed some of the more extreme forms of uh, of, of of exploitative caste uh, occupations so there's many many examples of this but but the gist of it is that we're trying to give people training that just enables them to step up out of that traditional caste based livelihoods which are nearly always daily wage labor. So they, they're, they're nearly always very, very financially precarious to give them just enough skills training to be able to step up into some kind of livelihood, which uh, gives them greater financial security and also this measure of dignity and self-respect and the chance to be treated with respect by people from other communities. And this is really the essence of, of what we're, interested in and involved in as an organization you know it's livelihoods yes it's helping people with their livelihoods but with a very particular emphasis on it, it's about dignity it's about human rights it's about um giving people the chance to live the kind of life of a respected citizen that that, that people in our societies would would normally take for granted that's the voice of Sudaka. He is head of programs at Karuna Trust. You can look them up online at karuna.org. Sangana is head of appeals. And Sangana, I wanted to get your perspective on that, but also to start bringing into the conversation the question of gender equality and this theme, right, of dignity it keeps coming back in, in everything that you guys do, in this provision of dignity and and preserving of dignity and just sort of coming i guess in into helping people to come into this awareness that they have that right to to feel and be dignified and uh, then as you think about the gender equality and that's a a topic of course that we we talk about around the world i think it's um, certainly talked about a lot in the west and um and yet from what you guys have shared given the caste system and some of the other things, again, going back to what Sudika mentioned earlier in the program, the gender equality um, situation in India and Nepal must, must be a big challenge even still. Uh, Sangana, let me turn it to you now for your comment, both on the, the livelihood question, but also the, the gender equality question. Yeah, I'll start with the gender equality. Uh, it's a, it's an important issue, really, uh, because 
as as you know, as Sudaka said, um, the women discriminated, double discriminated in India. Uh, the first is where they come from, which caste they come from, and secondly, because of she's woman, so the she is double discriminated. And having this objective for Karuna to do something for women, it's very, very important. And um, this is something we are passionate about it and we really want to do it. Um, uh, I mean, I, I was grew up in India and I have seen so many cases of, you know, uh, the gender equalities and uh, why education is uh, important for women, you know, as we say, once women educate in our family, we whole family is educated. So um, when I see my mom, you know, she doesn't have any education. Um, she she's uh, she's discriminated because she's not educated. She's from bottom of the caste. You know, she's going to this farm owner because she's discriminated because of she's from bottom of the caste as well. So yeah. So I, I'm sure um, Sudaka will uh, shed on more on education uh, for women, women equality, uh, so on. But this is something uh, really important for me and my society, and from for Indian perspective, uh, the women, women is uh, education for women, uh, equality for women is so so important. With right livelihood, um, I, I think. The Karuna, way Karuna work in education, women's empowering and right livelihood, it's a, it's a really good package, if you like. Education is so important to expand our opportunities in the world. You know, people from bottom of the caste, they never had an opportunity to educate. If you don't educate, you don't have opportunities to thrive socially, economically and uh, on all sorts of levels. So giving that opportunity to people in India and Nepal will bring up so many different opportunities, not just opportunities, but some kind of confidence and dignity in them. Same with women's empowering, you know, doing something for that, uh, fighting for women's empowering, it's important. Dr. Ambedkar said, you know, he's famously said, if you want to measure the the uh, development of your society community you measure how women are educated or how women are progressing in your society so that's that's the measure if you like if women are progressing in your society in community that's mean your society is progressing and with right livelihood it's because not everyone can get opportunity to educate and if you don't educate you don't really get Opportunity. So there are so many millions of people still remain in uh, uh, right livelihood that defined by caste, and we need to challenge that. You know, we need to challenge that. We need to change that. As a as a as myself, I was growing up in India. I was one of the child labor when I was growing up in India, and I have experienced how right livelihood even even affected me as a child. You know, and working with that sector is so important you can gain so much freedom you can achieve so much in india so i think that that's something i could just add really if you add i uh, want to add more so okay. that's the voice of sangana head of appeals for karuna at um, karuna trust and you can look them up online at karuna.org and this has been a great conversation. We're kind of heading now towards the end of this particular episode. Sudhika, I wanted to take it back to you, though, and and um, give you, first of all, of course, the opportunity to share anything that we need to say that hasn't been said. And mm -hmm. and we've, everything we've said has been important. Everything that's been discussed has mm -hmm. been important. But please, let's be sure if there's projects for the future or mm -hmm. you know, challenges that you guys are facing right now, please be sure to bring them up. And also... What does karuna mean? Karuna is a very, very beautiful word in Buddhism. It means um, compassion. It means uh, having a, a, a love for for other human beings, particularly in the context of wanting to respond to the suffering of, of others. So it, it translates pretty well as our word compassion, um, the desire to, to, to want to help others, to alleviate the suffering of others and, uh, and in a way you know our, our work w we aim to be a kind of expression of that although of course you know very very imperfectly um but you know we do try to 
you know, our orientation is around responding to the needs of, of, of you know, people who are in, in the greatest need uh, in those societies. And, you know, we, we work in the countries where we work, we work with the poorest communities and we, we try to ensure that our help is, is reaching to those, those poorest, most disadvantaged communities. I mean, of course, over the last year, we've been very, very focused on responding to uh, people affected by the coronavirus. I mean, that's been a huge focus for our work over the last year. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of, you know, emergency relief work, distributing food packages, distributing um, PPE, medical supplies. And again, you know, working through our partners, we're able to get that help to the most, in a way, that the hardest to reach communities you know the people who are really on the periphery who who need that the most and you know i'm sure that you know many many people have been 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 helped to stay alive as a result of the work that we've managed to do over the last year um and you know just just a couple of things maybe to say i mean you know from my point of view one of the great inspirations and privileges you know is to do with the amazing people that we we work with in india i mean i've come across well, Sanganath, for example, is a very, very inspiring person. Somebody who's made incredible changes and progress in, in in his life. And, you know, many people are like that, both people who have, have made tremendous changes in their lives and also people who are incredibly courageously dedicated to social change. I mean, something I really noticed that, that you know, some of the people who head up our partner organisations in India are just remarkable people, you know, people who are so committed, have got such, you know, such integrity, such a belief in trying to change things for the better. And I, and I find that really, really inspiring. And, you know, some, sometimes if you look at the situations in India, you know, the populations are so huge, you think, oh, no, you know, how are we ever going to make a difference to, you know, these kind of massive problems? But, you know, you see people over the over the space of, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, you see kind of generational changes coming through. You do see a whole generation of people who've been given those opportunities who, you know, have managed to educate themselves, have made a difference. You know, 20, 30 years ago, perhaps their parents were, you know, living in a slum in an urban area. They, they you know, were daily wage labourers, you know, very much trapped in that kind of traditional caste matrix and now you know 20 years later their children you know are, are, are doing something entirely different you know living lives of much greater sort of freedom and opportunity and you know much broader horizons um you know able to live lives that are much fuller and more satisfying so I think, you know, it is really inspiring to see that process of change happening, seeing people able to sort of grow and develop and, and, and access opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to. So that's the sort of magic of it for me. Sudhika, Head of Programs for Karuna Trust. And again, we're wrapping, wrapping up here, but let me, let me kick it back to Sangana for any uh, thoughts or anything that we've kind of left on the table that still needs to be said, Sangana, I'll let you have that opportunity, but also just want to thank you for joining us today. It, you know, of course, as Sudhika has mentioned, in particular, your story is very inspiring. And I know we've only scratched the surface. We've just barely even talked about that, but it's enough to to understand some of the challenges that and barriers that you've overcome. And it, it speaks to many, many wonderful things, many wonderful things, including the work of Corona. So anyway, Sangana, let me, let me let you have an opportunity to mention anything that needs to be said in the program today. Well, firstly, I'm so grateful to Karuna, be honest, because, uh, you know, Karuna's uh, project reached to my village when I was a child, and then I come across Karuna and I got benefit from them. Uh, so really grateful for them because they're reaching people like me, millions and millions of people, you know, they're reaching in India and Nepal. So that's one to, you know, uh, very grateful to them. Uh, second thing, really, you know, Dr. Ambedkar, I would, I would say, you know, Dr. Ambedkar is bigger than uh, our organization. You know, what he has done in India, Nepal, well, particularly in India, 
is uh, in, incredible, significant. You know, no money, not many people knows outside uh, India. Please look up his name. And if you really want to find out what caste system, you know, we were talking about caste system and how complex it is to understand. I mean, Dr. Ambedkar's book on annihilation of caste is brilliant. It will give you thoroughly understanding about how caste system operate in India and another book called Caste in India as well. So I, I would say, just want to finish with this really my gratitude to this particular uh, two people at, uh, at this event. One is Karuna Trust and more importantly, you know, more importantly, Dr. Ambedkar, you know, because of his vision, his work, I'm exist, I'm exist in uh, talking with you. So yeah, that's me. Very well said, Sangana, Sudaka. Any closing statements as we wrap up the show today? No, just to thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk about our work. As I say, we, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I always love talking about Karana's work, the amazing experiences that that I've had, and the amazing changes that I've seen happening in people's lives as a result of it. So, you know, just thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to speak. Well, thank you both for taking the time to share your heart, to share the work of Karuna Trust. And it's been a very educational and inspiring episode. And I would encourage anyone who has been listening and they think, you know what, this is something I want to, to get involved in or get behind or support, reach out to them at karuna.org. And Karuna is spelled K A R. U N A Karuna.org. And as always, if any of it gets confusing or you're trying to find the links, where's the video version? Where's the audio version? How can I find the <laughs> the podcast on Apple or Google or Spotify or whatever it may be? I what I've done to make that simple, including to find links to karuna.org, is you'll be able to go to theedgeofadventure.com and look on the podcast page. You'll find the corresponding post for this episode and I have done my best to put it all there in one spot for you so you can enjoy getting to know Karuna and be able to get in touch with them and all those good things at theedgeofadventure.com. So gentlemen, with that, we're gonna wrap up the show. I really have a great appreciation for what you're doing and there's so much more to learn. We'll just have to have you come back on the show sometime in the, the future to talk more. In the meantime, Carry on, brothers. Um, I appreciate what you do and the heart with which you do it. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll talk more. This is The Edge of Adventure, and we'll see you again next time.